with a where is Tiffany Dover? I'd appreciate it. Hang on a second. There we go. Better? Uh, I'd actually prefer if I didn't use the camera, if I just had like a still image because you guys don't really need to see me. But anyway, um, and I'm not showing you anything particularly interesting now, am I? You know, I've been very remiss in so far as, as, uh, as my channel is concerned, you know, the, the content has been kind of crappy, <laughs> like no exploding bombs or anything like that. No tanks or stuff like that. Mm. Mm. I'm just, uh, you know, shooting the breeze a little bit before we get going. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me properly. Where is Hunter Biden? And some injections and lines of uh, some white powder substance-like thing. Mm -hmm. Where is Tiffany Dover? Remember Tiffany Dover, please. See, when we forget the names of important people, uh, when we don't, when we fail to mention them, they disappear. And they disappear and, you know, whatever tragedy has befallen them was for nothing. Okay, so don't let that happen. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about Victoria Newland. Victoria Newland is a um, currently the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the United States State Department. She is a career bureaucrat, a career Foreign Service officer, and she is the woman most responsible for the current war that is going on here in Ukraine. One could argue, as I will argue here, that she directly led to this war. She instigated it. And she manipulated and bullied and uh, cajoled all of the players to get into this war that will result in the destruction of the Ukrainian nation, the scattering of the Ukrainian people, and uh, just misery all around. She is the one responsible. She is why there is a war here in Ukraine. And I'm going to explain how this happened, why she's the one who made it happen, what were her goals and objectives. See, you have to understand people don't wake up and decide, you know something? I'm going to be really evil today. It doesn't work that way. Hmm? People don't think that way. People don't say to themselves that they're just going to do something arbitrarily that's going to negatively affect a whole host of people for no good reason whatsoever. They always have good reasons. Now, one can disagree with those reasons. One can say that those reasons are bad, they're selfish, that they're, they're just not worth the, the cost, the consequences. Uh, that's very different. But nobody acts arbitrarily. And many times, the things that drive us to action, especially those people who are extremely smart but lack any self-awareness, they often are driven to their actions and their hatreds and their visceral reactions to different events by things that happened long ago. In some cases, by things that happened before they were born. And I'm going to argue that insofar as Victoria Newland is concerned. Because when you start looking into her biography, you realize all kinds of very, very interesting things about her. Her background the hatred and rage that she carries in her heart, which she is expressing by way of this destruction of Ukraine in hopes of ultimately destroying Russia, which is her real aim. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that she's aware of it. It's really fascinating. Because if she were aware of it, she wouldn't have allowed this to happen. But she's blind. So let's get started. Okay, as I said, Victoria Newland essentially runs American foreign policy insofar as Russia is concerned. See, uh, because she has started her career back in the early 90s, okay? And she worked her way, she started working under Strobe Talbot in the Clinton administration. Strobe Talbot was a very important uh, foreign service official in the 90s. Um, she then worked as an assistant to Dick Cheney as a deputy assistant insofar as foreign affairs was concerned. And she was the ambassador, the US ambassador to NATO, which is a very important position. And she's done different jobs over the years that have eventually led her to this position of Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, which when you hear the title, it seems so obscure. But she is very clearly a woman who much prefers to have the, the to be in the background, to maintain a very low profile. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm sure that one of her minions in the State Department or on her staff is watching this right now as we're speaking, you know, and hi there, how's it going? I hope you're, uh, you're having a good Sunday wasting it on me. <laughs> poor bastard or, or poor dumb girl, you know, but anyway. Victoria Newland um, is carrying out a policy which is very, very, very simple. The American goal, foreign policy goal, is to have a weak and preferably divided Russia, either actually divided into smaller Balk Balkanized countries or politically so divided that it's essentially inert. Basically, the American goal is to have a Russia like the good old days in the 90s. Because in the 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States was able to enter Russia and exploit it to a degree that is unprecedented. Uh, exploit it, steal from it. I mean, really just... Uh, uh, um, it's not too strong a word to say that, sh that Russia as a country was raped by American bureaucrats and American financiers and just the whole ne neoliberal ideology that was imported wholesale into Russia, which eviscerated the country, created these you know, obscenely rich oligarchs, even as the people were starving, even as the retirees and, and veterans of the Second World War were destitute in the streets. Hmm? The Americans created the horrible 90s for the Russians. And it is with some amazement that we can see how far Russia has come from those dark days of the 90s. But that's the Russia that the American establishment wants to see again. That's the Russia that people like Victoria Nuland and the class of people that she represents in the American bureaucratic establishment want to see imposed on Russia again. They want a Russia that is prostate. They want a Russia that is broken. They want a Russia that they can exploit like vultures. That is their goal, and they state it. They don't have any problem stating it, because their goal is to break Russia and then turn their full attention to China and break China. And the thing is, see, in, in their arrogance, they do not realize the weakness of the United States. They do not realize that the United States has become a hollow empire. Its people are dispirited and broken, or else they are degenerate and decadent. They do not realize that the United States has no industrial base, that these people themselves created the conditions for the, for the destruction of the industrial base in the United States, okay? People like Victoria Newland's husband, who I'll get to in just a moment, see? But what's important is to understand their goals. The goal of Victoria Newland and her class of leaders is to break Russia by any means necessary and at any cost that is necessary so as to later focus on China and do exactly the same thing to China, break China. Mm -hmm. Because they have come to the conclusion that they can never allow a peer, a peer nation to rise again. A peer nation, P-E-E-R, -E -E mm -hmm. in the sense that a nation that can match the United States militarily or economically. At this time, China matches the United States economically. And one can argue that in certain regards, Russia not only matches the United States militarily, but outpaces it in certain technologies that will prove to be crucial probably. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, the Americans, the American political establishment, bureaucratic establishment, excuse me, bureaucratic establishment, because all these people are bureaucrats, they're, they're locked into their positions and they don't need to go to the people to ask permission to have their jobs. Well, these people, they mean to break Russia, break China, and never again allow a peer nation to rise. And that is why we are about to experience a global war. In fact, I would argue that we are already in this global war. This is a hybrid war fought on multiple fronts, economic, military, political, informational, and I realize that in my own case, I am one of the people involved in this information war. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried to make it to decide. I mean, I have tried and I'm trying to be Switzerland insofar as this is concerned, to call them like I see them. Okay. And right now my focus is on the United States and Western Europe. And so here you have me giving you this discussion of Victoria Newland, whom you will see is a key player. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Ukraine, since 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, has been a cesspool of Western corruption. It's very important that you understand this. It's Western corruption. Because, you see, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a power vacuum. And into this power vacuum, very ambitious people, uh, 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 rapacious people, came and stole the goods of the state of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was broken up into several republics, uh, the Russian Federation, Belarus, Ukraine, and so forth, Kazakhstan, and the rest. And what happened was that in these different countries, oligarchs were not only allowed to rise, but were in fact encouraged to rise by the Western powers, in particular the United States, because the United States figured that by way of these oligarchs, these countries could be controlled. And so they outsourced tyranny to oligarchs, and they created a kleptocracy in each of these nations by prioritizing and giving attention, diplomatic attention, political attention, and even economic attention to these various oligarchs. And so in the starting line of 1991, Ukraine and Russia were in the same position. Ukraine became a cesspool of corruption because it was in the interest of the Westerners to maintain a corrupt Ukraine, to maintain a corrupt Russia. If Russia was corrupt, if Ukraine was corrupt, it would be easy for Western interests to go into these countries, Ukraine and Russia, and steal. Steal by way of crooked deals, no-show jobs, and all the rest of it. All the things that we understand. Take the assets of the state and strip them and take away all the riches that these countries have. Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, they are all incredibly rich insofar as natural resources, but they are also incredibly rich in terms of human resources. And yet these oligarchs from the West, these financiers, these horrifying people, these bureaucrats from the State Department that assisted them, they cared nothing for the people of the former Soviet Union. They cared only about stripping the assets and the money from the broken Soviet Union. And so Ukraine and Russia started at the same spot, okay? And if you look at Ukraine, let's look at Ukraine for a little bit. In terms of its people, who are highly educated and very decent and hardworking people, there are some countries, let's face facts, many countries in Africa, where the populace is not so hardworking. They do not try to uh, improve themselves, educate themselves, better their lives. It, it's a reality of life, and you know, to pretend otherwise is just stupid. And if you want to call that racist, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, I can speak about Latin America, and there are countries in Latin America where I am from, such as Bolivia, such as Ecuador, where the people simply do not have the initiative or the desire to improve their lives. They're happy with just good enough, tranquilo, tranquilo, and they don't really do anything. But the Ukrainian people are very hardworking. They're very stoic, and they are highly educated. You will meet people in Ukraine who are taxi drivers, and they can talk to you in English and discuss things that you would be surprised to be discussing with a university professor in the United States. They are wonderful, wonderful people, and this is a truism. Now, why is Ukraine so poor? It's because of Western corruption because the various oligarchs that control the country, and these oligarchs tend to control it by, by areas of the country, the so-called oblasts. Oblasts are basically like states or regions. And in the different oblasts, there are different oligarchs that control that area, that physical area. And they control the industries in that area. And these oligarchs are often is not a, a, a thuggish, thuggish uh, uh, mafia type who will have no trouble at all going up to some successful businessman who's a legitimately successful businessman, totally above board, and tell him, hey, give me your business, give it to me for free, or I'll kill your family. Which is, which they do. They've done, and I know people that this has happened to personally. Hmm? That they have gone up to them and said, give me your entire business, or I will kill your family. And that's the kind of people we're talking about here. Okay? Okay, so... Ukraine should not be this poor, but because of corruption, it is poor. It is the poorest nation of Europe at this time, I mean, quite apart from the fact of the war. Just without the war, it was the poorest nation, or perhaps the second poorest of Europe. It doesn't matter. A country of 45 million people that is the second or most poor country of the Europe, it's a disaster. They should be far wealthier because they have everything going for it. They have wheat. They have various uh, minerals, various necessary gases, neon gas is produced here, and they have people, the people here. 
but they're so poor. It's because they're exploited. Now, what's interesting is that Ukraine is this corrupt backwater, mm -hmm. because it is. And it is what Russia would have been had we not had Vladimir Putin in Russia. And this is something that deeply bothers the American bureaucratic class. Because when, when Putin arose, the people in the West thought, oh, he's one of our guys. They saw him as a former KGB agent. They saw him as a guy who would uh, go along to get along kind of guy. They saw him as a young man, educated, spent time in Germany, spoke fluent German, fluent English. Few people know this, but he does. And um, they thought that, you know, he's a man we can work with. Hmm? But what they discovered to their dismay was that when Putin took power in roughly 1999, he cut a deal with his oligarchs. And, he, and the deal was very simple. You stay out of politics and I'll stay out of your grift. And the oligarchs were like, okay, perfectly fine. But what happened was that slowly over the years, Putin started edging out the oligarchs and putting, on, putting in his own oligarchs. And even as he put in his own oligarchs, he started making those oligarchs smaller and weaker. See? Because he understood that he could not wipe out the oligarchs and all the corru corruption in Russia with the snap of his fingers. It had to be a slow grinding process, which is what he's been doing for the past 23 years. And the proof of this is very simple. The oligarchs who exist today, none of them had any power in 1999. The oligarchs of 1999 who remained in Russia, they're all gone. They're irrelevant at this time. And the oligarchs back in 1999 who disagreed with Putin, they're outside of the country. And in fact, many of them virulently disagree with Putin and what he has done. And they're just allowed to exist outside of Russia, but they don't really have much connection with Russia. Abramovich, for instance, is an example. He's not completely on the outs with Putin, but he's not besties either. And so that's what Putin has done. And if you look at the backwardness of Ukraine, you realize that had Putin not existed in Russia, Russia would be what Ukraine is today. Backwards, poor, destitute, just a, a shell of a country. And this is the truth. And if you don't like Putin or you love him, it's irrelevant. This is a realistic assessment of the situation in Russia. Now, Americans started realizing this in the late 2000s, early 2010s. They started realizing that Putin was subtly resisting them, resisting their attempts to turn Russia into a whore, the way that they had turned Ukraine into a whore, into a corrupt, destitute backwater. That's what they wanted for Russia, and Putin very effectively, subtly, quietly resisted them and went against them. And this became quite obvious in the early 2010s. Mm -hmm. And it peaked out, I mean, masks off with the 2014 revolution, okay? I'm gonna to get to that in just a moment. But first, let's look at Victoria Nuland, because it's very important that you understand Victoria Nuland uh, in order to understand what has happened today, okay? And you have to understand that she is very much a template of the kind of bureaucrat in the foreign policy establishment in the State Department of the United States. She is very stereotypical in terms of background, in terms of ethno-religious origin, in terms of obsession with Russia because of long historical grievances. You must understand that she is not an outlier. She is very much within the, the norm of the distribution curve. You see what I'm saying? Very important that you understand that. She is not extreme. She is the norm. Understand that. Okay, so Victoria Newland, if you look at a picture of her, she is actually a very attractive woman. Now she's, um, you know, she's about to turn 61 later in the middle of this year. She was born in 1961. Uh, when she was young, she was a very attractive woman. She's just gained weight with age, normal. Uh, her father was a man named Sherwin Newland. Now, if that name rings a bell, it actually did ring a bell with me. And I was trying to remember how I heard that name. It was because of a book called How We Die. It was a National Book Award winner in 1994 when I was in college. And that's why I remembered it. Because I do believe that Sherwin Newland, her father, 
went to Dartmouth to give a chat about his book. His book was a very big thing, okay? And it would not have been unusual for him to have gone to Dartmouth. I'm almost positive that he did. Um, other authors that were big at the time, like for instance, Francis Fukuyama, when he came out with uh, The End of History and The Last Man, he gave a, a talk at Dartmouth. I got him to autograph, autograph my books. So anyway, uh, the point is, it would have been normal, but I can't, I can't, I didn't go. <laughs> That's the thing, and now I regret it. So, but anyway, Sherwin Newland was a Yale surgeon and a popular writer of science, and he wrote this book, as I said, How We Die, which was a big bestseller in 1994. He was born Shepsel Nudelman. He was born in 1930 in uh, the Bronx, New York, and he was a very typical man of his class. He was the child of first-generation immigrants. His father, Victoria Newland's grandfather, was a man named Meyer Noodleman, who was a tailor. Now, he fled Bessarabia in um, uh, 1907. Now, this is a very interesting uh, date. Bessarabia is the area between um, Odessa and Moldova. It's a little sliver of land that exits on the Black Sea. In fact, Meyer Noodleman worked in Odessa, as I understand it, or just outside of Odessa. I, the, the, I, I've read several accounts and it seems to be a little ambiguous, but the point is that, see, he lived there. Um, he was born in, uh, oh fuck, I forgot to write down the date he was born in. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I wanna say uh, 1890 or something like that, but anyway. The point is that he fled Bessarabia in 1907, and this was immediately after the Kishinev pogrom. Now, the Kishinev pogrom was the systematic persecution of Jews uh, by Russians, by ethnic uh, Orthodox Christian Russians uh, in Bessarabia at that time. Do keep in mind, Bessarabia was a, a part of the, um, of the uh, Russian Empire. And what's really interesting if you look at Bessarabia historically, you look at their flag and it's kind of shocking because it's the Russian flag. <laughs> Bessarabia is the homeland of uh, Victoria Newland's family. In fact, she speaks um, English, of course. She speaks Russian because she studied Russian literature and she speaks Yiddish. She possibly speaks Ukrainian, although that's not clear and other languages I have not actually been able to find out, but that's not really important. What's important is that, see, Meyer Noodleman had an enormous impact on his son, Sherwin, Sher uh, or Shepsel Noodleman, as he was called. He changed his name when he was in high school before applying to university, went to Yale, uh, and eventually became a surgeon at Yale, uh, as I said before. And uh, Meyer Noodleman seems to have been a, a, a petty man, a little man, but filled with resentment, a, a, a small man with gigantic resentments, which he inflicted on his son. His son wrote uh, some memoirs about his father, which are kind of horrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, psychological abuse, that sort of thing, mild physical abuse, but not so important as the psychological abuse, you know, screaming fits and all the rest of it, that, that kind of thing. Sherwin Newland uh, describes it, how he felt his soul was flayed. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, a striking imagery, if you think about it. Now, what's extremely interesting is that Sherwin Newland, in 1970, when Victoria Newland was eight years old, nine years old, he started suffering a severe depression. Uh, in fact, he was hospitalized for a year. So you can see the impact that Meyer Noodleman, the grandfather of Victoria Newland, had on Victoria Newland's life. Noodleman had long since died by this point. But of course, uh, I mean, her grandfather had long since died by the time Sherwin Newland in 1970 checked himself into a psychiatric hospital. His depression was so severe that his doctors recommended that he have a lobotomy. Which is, Jesus Christ, talk about, you know, burning the village to save it, you know? I mean, holy cow. But, mm. so, um, the impact of Meyer Noodleman is very important. I think I'm a nine-year-old girl who's, um, father has gone to a psychiatric hospital for over a year with this intense depression and this intense misery. And you know for a fact 
you know, that it's because of your grandfather and the resentments of your grandfather. And your grandfather, of course, he's filled with resentment because he was kicked out of his homeland. Because Meyer Noodleman, by the accounts of his own son, never learned to speak English properly. And he felt a man of nowhere because he couldn't go back home to Bessarabia because of the pogroms uh, during the reign of the Tsar. And uh, he couldn't integrate into America in a way that Sherwin Newland certainly did. Sherwin Newland integrated himself into America quite brilliantly. He became this uh, extremely successful doctor and professor of surgery, this extremely successful writer. I mean, getting a National Book Award. Not many people can claim that, you know, it's quite remarkable. And so this, this dichotomy, mm -hmm. but ultimately it all comes back to Meyer Noodleson, Noodleman's rage, the fact that he was persecuted in Russia under that uh, white, blue, and red flag of Bessarabia that is now the white, blue, and red flag of Russia. Very striking, if you think about it. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The resentments of the grandfather are buried deep in the heart of Victoria Newland. Mm -hmm. The resentments and hatred, and ancient ancestral hatreds towards Russia that find inchoate expression and just rage and anger and wanting to destroy. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that. You have to understand the emotional motivation of Victoria Newland. Her father's depression that lasted over a year, that he was only able to get out of it with electroshock therapy. And of course, it wasn't like he just took an electroshock therapy and presto, he was better again. It, it was a long road, apparently. Mm -hmm. So as she grew up, a nine-year-old girl, and this must have started before then, a seven, eight-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl, while her father was away in this psychiatric hospital, 10, 11, 12, the most formative years of her young life. And she saw the broken man that was her father, the product of the broken man that was her grandfather. And her grandfather, why was he broken? Because of the pogrom, the Kishinev pogrom, that drove him out of Russia, that drove him out of their homeland. You see? You see what's going on? So anyway, Victoria Newland, she was a very successful student. She went to Rosemary Choate. Then she went to Brown, where she studied Russian literature. That's pretty interesting, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's the granddaughter of um, Jews who fled Russia, and she studies Russian literature, political science, and history. <laughs> huh? I mean, come on, do, do, you know? And you can say, oh, this is just armchair psychology. No, you know, sometimes you know, these very obvious things are just expressions of what's really going on. It's not complicated. Mm -hmm. Her interests express her drives. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my own case, for instance, I studied history and philosophy. And it's very obvious why. I wanted to understand why things were, and I wanted to understand the logic behind things. I wanted to understand what had happened and what were the logical steps that had led to each of those things. It's no trick at all why I studied those two topics. Mm -hmm. She studied Russian literature, she studied political science, and she studied history mm, about Russia. Mm. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Mm. Um, she married a man named Robert Kagan. She has no children, by the way, and that's always a bad sign. When a woman, a professional woman, like an accomplished woman, has no children, you know she's messed up in the head, okay? Because I, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, I don't care if I sound sexist or whatever. I do believe that a woman who with children, the fact of having children relieves them of some psychic burden. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a hormonal effect of calming them down. Also children, since they suck up so, so much attention, it paradoxically reduces a woman's neuroticism. Mm -hmm. I've noticed women who were extremely neurotic before they had their child. And after that, the fact that the child sucks up so much attention, because all children do, it's perfectly natural, they became far less neurotic and concerned about other things in their lives. They were very focused on their child and very concerned, but their neuroticism generally was just sort of like, it, they, their concern focused on their child and the rest of their life, it was much more mellow, much more balanced. 
Mm -hmm. But a woman without children, she doesn't have that. Okay, so she married Robert Kagan. Now, Robert Kagan is a very interesting character. Robert Kagan is, of course, a Jewish American, and he founded in 1997 a uh, thing called the Project for the New American Century with another uh, Jewish, uh, successful Jewish intellectual with uh, New York roots and first generation Jewish immigrants called Bill Kristol. Now, the goal of the Project for the New American Century, which lasted less than 10 years, but it was very influential, it was to, quote, promote American global leadership. Well, that's just a euphemism for American global dominance. That's what they were talking about. And they wanted to have a Reaganite policy of military strength and moral clarity. Military strength, that's pretty obvious. It, it, it finds expression in the, in the doctrine of full spectrum dominance that the American military tries to impose everywhere. But the moral clarity issue, that's, that's slippery. What they really want is to be able to reduce, morally reduce everything to good guys, bad guys. We're good, we are white hats, and they, they are bad. And we have to kill them with our great full spectrum dominance military. And that was basically the, the, the project the new, of the, for the new American century. Uh, I guess it twofold. Promote American global leadership <laughs> and uh, military strength and moral clarity. They push for regime change. That's how they found <laughs> the way for uh, global leadership and, and uh, moral clarity. The whole notion was to regime change any country that didn't toe the American line. Hmm? If it towed the American line and did whatever the United States wanted, then it was allowed to exist. But if their leaders strove for any kind of regional dominance, or, or, or had aspirations that went against or opposed American interests, that regime had to go. Iran, for instance, a typical example. Iran has been a bugaboo for years, and they've tried to start a war with it and all kinds of things, because Iran poses a challenge twofold. Number one, it's the implacable enemy of Israel. And as you can see, most of these people of the foreign policy establishment, and not just the ones I've mentioned, there are tons more, they are mostly Jewish, and many of them come from families that were Zionists, that were, um, that were fundamentally fundamental to the conception of Israel, and they have strong ties to the Israeli state, both at the political level and on the personal level. Okay? And so, of course, they are very much against the Iran regime and want regime change. They want Iran to have a friendly regime. And the other thing, too, is that they want to be able to control Iran's oil. Mm -hmm. It's resources, just as they did during the period of the Shah before January of 1979. Mm -hmm. That fact that Iran threatens Israel by its mere existence and that it has oil, an unfathomable wealth that it does not share with uh, American companies and American financiers, that's enough to want regime change in Iran. And to get rid of Saddam Hussein in Iraq was just the first step. Well, the very first step was, uh, was Afghanistan. But Afghanistan was sort of like a, like a prelude. It was merely uh, based on the excuse of the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. the World Trade Center, the 9-11 situation. And that's why Afghanistan was taken over. Um, the, the real regime change came with Iraq in 2003. The war in Iraq was started under false pretext. pretext. There were no weapons of mass destruction. And uh, um, Scott Ritter, who I've been in touch with and hopefully I'll be able to do a, a, a broadcast with because he's a very interesting fellow, uh, he was the weapons inspector. And there were no weapons of mass destruction there. Uh, but, you know, they pushed that in order to have the justification for the war. The project for the new American century was pivotal to that. Now, Robert K uh, Kagan, today, he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's also on the Council of Foreign Relationships, on re Foreign Relations, rather. And he is a pivotal figure. He is the man who pushes this extremely aggressive, extremely arrogant uh, American foreign policy. He's the intellectual architect of it. He doesn't actually execute it. He's actually never held, uh, as far as I can understand it, any kind of formal... Uh, position in the foreign policy establishment, but he is extraordinarily influential because he, and to a lesser extent Bill Kristol, are the nexus between moneyed interests, 
corporate interest and government interests. And he pivots between them and takes these different interests and guides them towards um, aggressive American foreign policy decide, designed to destabilize nations so that they can be easily exploited economically and pushed around in terms of doing what the American bureaucrats at the U.S. State Department want for their own benefit or for the benefit of the various financiers that they are attached to, the various financiers or the various corporate interests, corporate interests in security and weapons manufacturing, you see? So Robert Kagan is this very pivotal figure, and Victoria Newland is, of course, married to him. And since they don't have any children, uh, I find it laughable because a, a man without a children is nothing as far as I'm concerned, but uh, since they don't have children, they have all the time in the world to pursue their fairly nefarious agenda, if you think about it. Because ultimately what they want is American global dominance, but it's arrogant. It's, it's not uh, benign. It's not a, an American uh, dominance whereby, yes, the United States is the biggest gorilla in the jungle, but the gorilla doesn't want to mess with you unless you mess with him. There have been other empires in, in past history. The Roman Empire, to give a very easy example. So long as you didn't mess with them, they didn't mess with you. You know, If you paid them tribute and uh, did what they wanted insofar as major foreign policy issues, fine. But this... State Department cabal, if you want to call it that, foreign policy cabal, they insist on micromanaging everything. Now, that's the thing. They want things just like they want it. And they come in insect-like and try to steer everything, every last little thing. And we'll see how this happened with Victoria Newland in 2014, just a little bit. But um, before I, I keep on going, do you guys more or less follow what I'm saying and understand what I'm saying? You know, hit me with a... Uh, you know, plus three, 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 if everything is okay, if you guys are following what I'm saying, okay? Um, it, it's important that you understand this background before we dive into what's currently happening, okay? Okay, uh, isn't Robert Newland also of Polish, I don't know, uh, I don't know who, um, you're talking about Robert Kagan, Kagan, I don't know, but Kagan is Jewish, Okay, um, I do believe that he is from uh, his family it comes from north of Belarus, northern Belarus, rather, uh, around the Baltic states, someplace like that. Um, okay, so Victoria Newland, she started out. Um, you know, the first important job she had was as Strobe Talbot's assistant. Strobe Talbot was a foreign policy advisor to Bill Clinton and a close friend of Bill Clinton's uh, since donkey's years, and she worked for him from '93 to '96. And then she was the deputy director for former Soviet Union affairs from 96 to 2003, as I understand it. Now, this, this position is very interesting. She basically looked after the, the, the countries of the former Soviet Union. And, of course, her job was to keep them weak. That was the point, okay? That's what America strove to do during all of the 90s, to keep the former Soviet Union countries weak, broken, uh, uh, dispirited so that American and to a lesser extent European financiers and 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 uh, busybodies and whatnot could go in and exploit them, exploit them and steal. That was the whole point of it. See? And what Ukraine is today, the, the cesspool of corruption, this backwater where uh, uh, Western politicians, you know, like the Biden family, like the Kerry family, the Pelosi family, all of these people, they come to Ukraine and they steal. Did you know that uh, Joe Biden, when he was uh, vice president under Obama, he came to Ukraine every three months? Do you have any idea how often that is to go to one damn country every three months? Why do you think? He probably walked out with the equivalent, if not an actual suitcase full of money. That was the point of it, see? Because he was stealing. And he actually bragged about it. He bragged about how he had gotten a prosecutor fired. There's famous footage of that. You should look it up. Mm -hmm. He bragged about it, and everybody laughed and thought it was so funny, such a funny quip. But basically, he said in that quip, he was saying, look, if you don't get this prosecutor to stop investigating the company that's paying me off, I will keep the Obama loan guarantees for over a billion dollars from being approved for you. And you're going to do it now in the next half hour. And he got his way. 
And he made a joke about it. Huh? I mean, it's pretty damn despicable. That is open, blatant corruption, and nobody called him out on it. Huh? Certainly not the people from the Council on Foreign Relations or the Brookings Institute, where Robert Kagan is. Of course not. See, because that's the job of these people to exploit Ukraine. And Victoria Newland's job as deputy director for former Soviet Union affairs was to exploit Russia and to a lesser extent, Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus. That was the point of it, to exploit them and suck as much money as they possibly could out of it to the benefit of American companies, American interests, American oligarchs. Because there are oligarchs in the United States. Don't give me this nonsense, huh? And you think that Elon Musk is your friend? Oh, Elon Musk is so cool. Look, look at his tweet. Isn't he cool? He's just like all the others. He just wants to suck you dry. He looks at you the exact same way that a spider looks at a bumblebee as food to suck out all the juices from you and leave you an empty husk. You ever seen a bumblebee after it's been eaten by a, by a spider? Hmm? It's this big thing and you, and you pick it up, right? It's totally hollow, it's been sucked out. That's America. America is hollowed out because of these insects. Hmm? Her job was to help these insects suck out the juices from the former Soviet Union. And they were very successful in Ukraine, and that's why Ukraine is a shithole, a backwater, a broken nation. That's the reason, because of her efforts. She assisted in the corruption. Because, of course, in order for corruption to work, you have to create the conditions of corruption. Uh, Pedro Escobar in uh, Colombia, the famous drug lord, he had a saying, plomo o plata? You know, to any corrupt official, he would uh, send a little uh, a little piece of paper, okay? And in the piece of paper, there's a little bundle. In the piece of paper, there'd be a bullet and a silver coin, okay? And and the, the bullet is lead, plomo. Plomo means lead in Spanish. And the, and the coin was a silver coin, which is in Spanish, plata. Plomo o plata? The bullet or the coin? Which is it going to be? That was Victoria Newland's job, to make sure that it was the coin, the corruption, the grift. And they exploited Ukraine and they exploited the other countries for the benefit of American companies. And what happened, and what she started noticing probably, um, is that Putin was playing ball, but not quite really. And my guess, this is a guess, okay, it's pure speculation on my part. I think that, you know, in this time, in the early 2000s, into the mid and late 2000s, she wasn't paying that much attention to Putin because she got a lot of stuff on her plate all of a sudden because she became assistant to Dick Cheney in 2003. And she lasted there a couple of years before becoming U.S. ambassador to NATO in 2005 through 2008. And, uh, you know, during these times under Cheney and then when Cheney put her in NATO, because he put her, it's not that she got kicked out or fired. No, no, no. She's too good of a suck up to get fired. No, no, no. She was transferred over, eased into the NATO position. Mm -hmm. And it was all to mobilize support for regime change, regime change in Iraq and support the Afghanistan occupation. She was pivotal in the support of the occupation of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, because of this, this probably distracted her from her main job, which was looking after the former Soviet Union, making sure that they remained as corrupt as possible. But Putin kind of like slipped away. And my speculation is that she probably thought, oh, it's just some weird KGB shit and let's just leave him alone and figure it out. But what he was really doing was easing out the really grotesque oligarchs and slowly bringing that down, see? Because that's clearly his goal. If you look at Putin and you, you read about him, you realize that he is an incredibly cynical man, cynical about absolutely everything except Russia, Russia as a concept, okay? And this is very common among great leaders, okay? I'm not talking about great leaders in a moral sense that he was a very good leader, in, in, in like, he, like he was righteous, okay? No, I'm saying great leader in terms of powerful, uh, great leaders in terms of changing history, because whatever you think of Putin, he is changing history, and you can't deny that, okay? He's a more world historical figure than, say, Joe Biden will ever be. Joe Biden is a puppet. He's a nothing. He's a pathetic old man, 
But uh, Vladimir Putin, no, he's a world historical figure. And he is the man who prevented Russia from becoming Ukraine. But Victoria Newland didn't notice this, okay? And so she was busy from 2003 to 2008 mobilizing support for regime change and all the rest of that shit, right? Now, what's interesting is that um, as ambassador, as U.S. ambassador to NATO, she would have been instrumental in pushing NATO right up to the border with Russia. She knew exactly what was going on. A woman with her background, not only in terms of her family, but also in terms of her education at Brown. Uh, I mean, Brown now is just a fucking joke. and It's been a joke for 20 years, but back when she graduated, at least, it was still, you know, some place to be taken seriously in terms of education. And there's no reason to think that she was not educated in the history of Russia, the history of NATO, and how sensitive Russia has always been historically to any great power encroaching on its border. And it's because of a function of geography, because Russia basically has no natural uh, uh, land, uh, natural border with Western Europe. And that's why, you know, the French and during Napoleon and, and the Germans under Hitler were able to advance so deep into Russia because there's no natural border. Okay, there's no natural defense, not like Switzerland, for instance, where you have the Alps. It's, it's essentially a natural fortress. Okay, it's impossible to conquer. Nobody will ever conquer Switzerland, but it's, it's potentially easy to conquer uh, Russia because there's nothing. It's just flat plains. Okay, all the way to the Ural Mountains. And so she would have known how sensitive the Russians, be they Imperial Russia, uh, Soviet Russia or, or Russian Federation would be to NATO encroachment, and yet she was the one pushing it. Mm -hmm. She pushed forward uh, this kind of encroachment. And it started, of course, with her old boss from the very beginning, Strobe Talbot, who also was a man who hated Russia for reasons of his own that aren't important for this conversation. But, um, but what's, what happened was that she saw how Russia was getting up and how it was evolving and pulling away from the, from the good old days of the 90s, good old days for the, the rapacious financiers and, and, and oligarchs and, and, and riffraff and evil people hmm, who had been in Russia during the 90s, but which had destroyed Russia. Well, Putin was resurrecting Russia, resurrecting it and improving the standard of living of the people. Hmm? The standard of living of the people between 1999 and 2013 in Russia rose phenomenally. The whole country became much, much more successful, better off. And you compare the, the fate of Russia during those 14 years and the fate of, say, Ukraine in those 14 years, and it's night and day because there wasn't somebody to halt the Western corruption. See, that's the difference. And that is the fundamental problem because Victoria Nuland and Robert Kagan and that whole cabal in the US State Department, in the foreign policy establishment. They want a broken Russia. They cannot stand the fact. And it's, and it's because of, number one, arrogance, because they insist that America has to be not only the biggest and strongest country, but far and away the most powerful. Like, like just, they want to maintain the power imbalance like the Americans had after the Second World War, number one. And number two, and this is something that is very disturbing to people, but you have to face it. There are long-standing ethno-religious hatreds towards Russia. They hate Russia with a passion. It, they would be happiest if Russia were obliterated in a mushroom cloud. And that's a fact. They hate it. They hate it with a passion for the, the psychological reasons that I've explained before. Because you have to understand, all the uh, people who are running American foreign policy are the children of Jews who made it in America, but the grandchildren of Jews who fled pogroms in Russia, in Russia or Belarus or wherever, in Eastern Europe. And that, that kind of generational trauma, it expresses itself in resentment and rage towards the source of that ancient ancestral trauma. You have to look at the facts. And, and if somebody wants to say that, oh man, you're being anti-Semitic or some shit like that, listen, uh, I descend from a man named Jose Miguel Carrera, right? And uh, he was betrayed by a man named Bernardo Higgins, right? And I was taught to spit at the name of Bernardo Higgins. You know? 
and that all happened, you know, 200 years ago. I'm not kidding. He, he, was, uh, he was assassinated, basically, in 1821. And 200 years later, here we are. And we, my family still hates his guts, but not Dohim's guts. Yeah. See, and, you know, ancestral hatreds, you know, they, they ripple. They ripple down into the future. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, there's that famous line from uh, 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 William Faulkner. Um, the past is never over. It's never even the past. It's very true. I, I think that's the line. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, chat. The past is never over. It's never even the past. Yeah. Uh, it's a great line. It's very true. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans, many Americans want to think that, you know, you, you wake up in the morning and you're a, a, a blank as obviously all of these people did. And these tight-knit families, they tell stories of generations before. I know stories of my own family. Uh, growing up in Latin America, growing up every Sunday, sitting around the, uh, my grandmother's dining room table, and she would tell me stories of her mother and her grandmother and her great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. The stories of how our family had come from Germany, how my uh, great-great-grandmother as a young 16-year-old girl had convinced her, uh, um, her spinster older sister to leave um, Schleswig-Holstein and chase after this handsome uh, 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 German naval officer who had stopped at the port that they, were, uh, that they were living in and she had fallen desperately in love and she chased him and married him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I heard those stories. You know, and some of them were romantic and some of them were funny and some of them were tragic, you see? In tight-knit families, that happens all the time. And you hear these ancient stories mm -hmm. and they mark you. And a woman like Victoria Newland, she watches as her father, whom she must have loved very much. We all, you know, when we are children, we all love our parents. And to see him so broken up by something that had happened with his father and his father's trauma because of being persecuted in Russia, in the home country, and being alienated all his life in the new world, that affected her. Of course it did. And, it, and that, that trauma, that rage, that resentment, it expresses itself. It expresses itself today. That's why Victoria Newland hates, hates Russia and wants it broken. Because it's not so much that she's a greedy, evil woman. Well, she might be that for all I know, but that's not really the reason as far as I can tell. The real reason is that she wants to get back at the Russians for what they did, what they did to her grandfather, which affected her father and broke her father, see, because that's what really happened. And that kind of rage within that woman, it can never, it's a wound that can never be solved. So, so that brings us to the Maidan revolution, the so-called revolution of dignity in 2013 and 14. Okay. Now, you have to understand that Victoria Newland, when, when things started going topsy-turvy, because they had been trying to pull Ukraine into NATO for quite some time, and they, they were doing it by promising to pull in uh, Ukraine into the European Union. Mm -hmm. And the European Union, it, it, I've been here, you know, and, and Ukrainians, God love them, they think that if they join the European Union, all of a sudden, all the streets are going to be paved in gold. Mm -hmm. They think that, that, that everything is going to work. There will be no more corruption, no more having to pay off people, everything from the, from the traffic cop to the, to the teacher at the school to whomever. You know? They think that everything will be wonderful if they join the EU. They dream about it and they insist. They insist that once they join the EU, it'll be just so much better. You know, they actually like made the license plates similar to the EU license plates. I mean, if you just glance at the Ukrainian uh, license plates, you can't tell the difference if it's, you know, I mean, it, it looks exactly like the Ukrainian license plates. It's white with a little blue square on the side, you know, and the lettering and the font is exactly the same, you know, they want it so badly, they can taste it. And NATO, yeah, that'd be nice too, but they don't really give a shit about that. They care about the prosperity 
and sophistication and freedom and wonderful life and freedom from corruption that would entail being a part of the European Union project. That's what they dream about. Mm. Of course, they don't see the alienation. They don't see the decadence and degeneracy. They do not see uh, how the meaninglessness of European life leads to not only depression, but drug addiction, a drug addiction of both illegal drugs and also legal drugs, antidepressants and such medications. They don't see the alienation of the people within generations and from each other. They don't see how it is almost impossible now for young men and young women to come together and form strong, stable, romantic and emotional bonds that will lead to flourishing families. They don't see that. They don't see it at all. And many times they don't even believe you when you tell them that that's the way it is in Europe, in the European Union. They don't believe you because of course, you know, because when you talk to a child and you the child has grown up convinced of Santa Claus, nothing you tell them will dissuade them, okay? It, it will take them only some shock, like they, they, they like stumble upon their parent in, in a closet somewhere, putting together their bicycle. And then they're like, oh my God, Santa Claus doesn't exist. That actually happened to me, by the way. I, I stumbled upon my, my dad uh, building the, the bicycle that I was going to get for Christmas, the one that Santa Claus was going to give me. And I'm not going to tell you how old I was because it's fucking embarrassing. It was way too old. <laughs> But anyway, that's, that's just neither here nor there. But my point, that's a very serious point. Uh, the people in Ukraine believe fantasies. Okay, and because of these fantasies, they will not believe you if you tell them that it's not that way. And of course, their leaders and people like Victoria Newland want them to continue to believe. And so they spew out propaganda and they pay for very, very expensive propaganda that will make them believe in these lies. You see? Now, um... Victoria Newland, when she came to Ukraine in 2014, well, she'd been encouraging Ukrainians by indirect methods to join NATO, to join the European Union. And they had made all kinds of deals and monies had gone here and there to, you know, to, to, to have NATO enter Ukraine, but like, like underground, okay? And they were all over Ukraine. And in fact, as the biolabs issues have revealed, the United States established all kinds of stuff in Ukraine. And here's the thing, see, over the decades now, the Ukraine, the, um, there are a lot of dead bodies in Ukraine. I'm not talking about literal dead bodies. I'm talking figurative dead bodies. There are a lot of bodies buried in Ukraine, okay? And the Americans now are kind of desperate about that. I mean, it's a real issue. The biolabs thing, that's, that's one, but it's not the only one, okay? The corruption issue. That's the one that I think freaks them out the most because there's so much corruption. It's so grotesque and blatant, you know? It's like the Hunter Biden laptop, but, you know, just, just magnitudes, multiple magnitudes bigger, just all kinds of shit. And of course, we don't know it when it is, but it's there, okay? That's part of the drive for the West and so far, the Americans especially, insofar as Ukraine is concerned, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, um, Newland had been pushing, you know, for uh, um, Ukraine to be, uh, you know, more pro-Western and all the rest of it. Now, Yanukovych was playing, uh, who was the president at that time, in 2014, 2013. He was playing the typical double game that a lot of leaders on the borders of Russia had been playing. Sort of like playing Europe and Russia off each other for their own benefit. Lukashenko, for instance, the dictator of Belarus. He's been doing that since forever. He came to power in 91, uh, and he's been in power ever since. And he, in, before, before 2020, when they tried to color revolution him, he was playing the, um, the Russians off the Europeans and trying to get good deals from both of them, you know? I mean, as you do. I mean, if you're, if you're between two great powers and they both kind of need you, well, you know, what's a guy going to do? I mean, you know what I'm saying? So that's what Lukashenko was doing. That's in Belarus. And that's what Yanukovych was doing. And that's in uh, Ukraine. He was the president of Ukraine. It was a, 
you know, fat old corrupt guy. Eh, nice guy, I'm sure, you know, but, uh, you know, good for, I, I bet he was good for, for going out for drinks and stuff, you know, and, and he knew probably the best stripper clubs and shit like that. Probably knew a whole bunch of really good hookers, but, you know, what an inconsequential fellow. There's this famous video <laughs> that's really goddamn funny where one time he's standing there with um, Dmitry Medvedev and uh, Vladimir Putin in some ceremony. They're all dressed up in dark clothes, right? The three of them, right? Just the three of them. And this is, I think, in Russia, Ukraine, I don't know where, but it's some ceremony is happening. And the camera's focused on these three guys. And, and Yanukovych, who's bigger than the other two, he kind of like, he's like looking very serious. And then he sort of like reaches into his pocket and pulls out a candy, <laughs> a little candy thing. And he offers it to the other two. And the, the two of them, just each of them in turn goes like, no, no, thank you, you know, and, and focus back on the ceremony. And they both mothers like, this guy's a fucking idiot, you know? The word is that Putin did think he was a fucking idiot, but, well, well, it's pretty funny. Anyway, the point. Uh, see, Yanukovych was trying to play both sides off the middle. And, um, and he wasn't playing ball with the West. And there was a lot of political pressure insofar as, you know, not... Uh, um, abusing the Russian citizens so much. Because you have to understand, in y Ukraine, Ukraine, the Ukraine that exists today, it's the agglomeration of two distinct people, the Ukrainian people and the Russian people. The Russians dominate the East and the South. The Ukrainians dominate the Center and the West, okay? And Kiev is sort of like a 50-50 split, but it tends more towards Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians. Now, the ethnic Ukrainians have their own language, uh, and they are ethnically different from the Russians. I personally find it very difficult to tell the difference, um, but I'm kind of like starting to notice it uh, because the conflict here has, has started to, you know, cleave the two ethnic groups, which is unfortunate. And I think it's something that the Americans are certainly encouraging. Anyway, uh, what, what happened was that the, um, the Yanukovych regime did not want to impose anti-Russian measures that a lot of Ukrainians wanted, a lot of hard right Ukrainians. Now you have to understand that the hard right, and I'm talking Nazi hard right, I'm not talking full on thugs, paramilitary thugs, okay? Uh, involved in some criminal activity to maintain, uh, to get their money, right? But ideological, I'm fucking nuts, man. I mean, all these people like right sector, like S14, like Azov Battalion, Adam Battalion, they're all fucking crazy, okay? I mean, you gotta keep that in mind. They're all fucking nuts. They're American History X type neo-Nazis. They're not LARPers. They're not fucking around. They're for real, okay? Uh, they're, you know, the, the white nationalists of the prison gangs, like that kind of neo-Nazi. They're, they're fucking evil, okay? On my Telegram channel, I posted videos of these fucksticks uh, shooting, kneecapping, shooting with assault rifles, the knees of their prisoners of war, their Russian prisoners of war, okay? Now, this is very important because these, eth because the ethnic Russians, they don't have this hatred for the ethnic Ukrainians, but the ethnic Ukrainians have this hatred for ethnic Russians. And th this is a key issue. Uh, um, the, the, the ethnic Russians, they're, they're, they're there's no hatred in their heart for them, okay? And I believe that the ethnic uh, Ukrainians, or at least a, a, a vocal sector of them, have this hatred for the ethnic Russians because they have always been put upon. Mm -hmm. they, they've always been the losers in the historical game. And that happens with smaller people who live between bigger people. The ethnic Ukrainians live between the Poles, the Hungarians, and the Russians. And they're smaller, they're, they're fewer, fewer in number and not so strong as those other powerful nations, those powerful ethnicities. The Hungarians and the Poles and the Russians, they are very uh, definite as to who they are. They have a strong identity and they don't put up with any shit. And perhaps now uh, Hungary and Poland are not great powers. In a couple of centuries, who knows what'll happen because they have that uh, wellspring of, of great power. Hungarians the same, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for crying out loud, you know? Uh, but the Ukrainians, they've always been the smaller people between and squeezed by these bigger people, these bigger powers. And so perhaps that's why you have that great resentment and that great resentment leads to horrifying extremists. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have. Now, 
these extremists, these Ukrainian extremists, they hate ethnic Russians. And that fits very neatly with Newland. Because Newland, throughout her career, she has always allied herself with groups that were extremely antagonistic towards Russians. She never compromised with that throughout her career. She's always allied herself with people who hate Russians, hate them. Mm -hmm. And so when the Maidan revolution started, she supported the right sector. The right sector is a key group. It is a group of neo-Nazis and they were funded uh, in part by the oligarch, uh, the oligarch, the uh, Ukrainian Israeli Cypriot oligarch Igor Kolomoisky that I've spoken about many times before. See, Newland and Kolomoisky worked together and they worked to organize the right sector. Newland organized them and Kolomoisky financed them. He also financed the Azov Battalion, okay? And I find it very difficult, if not impossible, to believe that Newland was, number one, not aware of this. She knew about it, of course. And number two, not in very close contact with these fascist paramilitary, because that's what the Azov Battalion is. It's a fascist paramilitary. Now, um, uh, you see, uh, where's this note? Where did he go? Okay. Very important to understand that she cemented a relationship with a man named Dmitro Yarosh, who is the head of the right sector. Dmitro Yarosh. And this guy's a neo-Nazi fascist. <laughs> Just flat out. It's like kid ourselves, okay? And he, Yarosh, was Newland's, Victoria Newland's guy insofar as the right sector. And Yarosh led the right sector, but Newland gave him his marching papers. Now, here comes a big, big, this is rumor, but so many people have said that this is true, that, okay. During the Maidan Revolution, which is a very confusing set of events, and I suggest you watch the Oliver Stone documentary, um, Ukraine Burning, okay, or Under Fire Ukraine. I forget the name of the damn thing. Uh, I've watched it twice and I forgot the name of the thing. But in that documentary, it gives a very, very good account of the Maidan Revolution and how it happened and the steps towards it. And there is famously, there is this period where there, was, there were snipers who were killing off police and killing off people and it's just like a whole fucking nightmare, okay? And it is um, the rumor, unconfirmed. The rumor is that they were Israeli snipers. They were mercenaries, Israeli mercenaries. Okay, that's the rumor, okay? And certainly somebody like Kolomoisky with deep ties to various uh, um, criminal uh, uh, groups and, and, and criminal subcultures in Ukraine, the United States and Israel, he would have had access or, or, or he would be able to get in touch with such Israeli snipers, but this is a rumor, okay? However, what uh, the other rumor is that Newland was the woman, or the person rather, who came up with the idea of creating a provocation by way of snipers. Mm -hmm. And that's the rumor. Rumor, okay? It's said by enough people that one can think that this is likely true. That snipers were there is unquestioned. Nobody has been able to capture them and know who they were. Okay, so that's why when I say that's a rumor, it is a rumor. But something I've learned over the years, see, is that it's usually very, very difficult to keep a secret. Okay, and so the fact that there were snipers in Maidan Square during the revolution, and had they been from either side, had they been right sector, had they been government snipers, police snipers, whomever, that information would have filtered out because people can't keep, keep a secret. The only people who can keep secrets are mercenaries. That is, figures from far away who are brought in to do a specific task and then sent on their, on their way. Because since they have no social connection to the environment, they come in, they do their task, and they fly away. There's no way for the information to leak out, you see? Mm -hmm. Uh, many years ago, uh, a fairly unsavory character once told me that if I really wanted something done, I'd always hire a mercenary, you know, because there will be never any way for them to, to tie it up with you. Have a good alibi and hire some mercenaries and you're untouchable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So good to know. So that's the rumor. The fact is nobody's ever known which side uh, were the snipers on? Were they government forces or revolutionary forces? Doesn't matter. Uh, the Maidan revolution came, it became violent. 
during the Maidan Revolution, before Yanukovych had fallen, famously, Victoria, Newland, uh, Victoria Newland's phone was tapped. It's not clear if her phone was tapped or the phone of the other person she was speaking to, who was a man named Jeffrey Pyatt. Jeffrey Pyatt was the US ambassador to Ukraine. And the tapped call that was recorded and the recording released, uh, it was Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt discussing uh, how to form the successor government to the Yanukovych regime, even though Yanukovych was still in power at the time, but the revolution was raging. And, it, and at the time it was still like nonviolent. It hadn't, they hadn't upped up the, they hadn't amped up the violence yet. Okay, when they recorded this call. Now, the word is that it was the Russians who did it, which makes sense because it could have been that Newland or Pyatt or both recorded the call, but why would they release it? Hmm? I mean, it would make sense, you know, for both of them to record the call and hold it perhaps later as insurance in case of anything, but neither one of them fell out with each other. And so why was it released if one of them had recorded it? But the Russians recording it, that makes a lot more sense. So... The Russians released that recording. It was clearly to undermine the re the revolution. It was a very poor way to undermine it. It was interesting, but it didn't really affect the outcome because the revolution happened. And, um, and all of a sudden, in that call, you had how Newland and Pyatt were micromanaging the new regime. In that call, which is fairly extensive, they are heard discussing which political figure should head the interim government, and why. And the, uh, Newland picked uh, Yatsenyuk, Yatsenyuk, yeah, uh, to be the new leader of uh, Ukraine, the, the interim prime minister, rather, of Ukraine, because she wanted to save Klitschko, another political figure, you know, a famous boxer, wanted to save Klitschko for later, you know, for li like more long-term, see. I mean, she micromanaged it like that thing. And, and, you know, talking about different people at different positions in the government, a real, you know, fine tuning, you know, and she was right in the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, that kind of micromanaging, mm -hmm. because it speaks of a, a certain type of personality, because there are some people like, to give an example, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan never micromanaged a goddamn thing. Okay. What he did was he just gave gen general, we want to go that direction and you, you boys figure it out. We're going that way. And, and his boys, you know, George Schultz and Caspar Weinberg and whomever, would say, but why don't we go over there? No, no, we're going that way. That's where I want us to go. How we get there, you figure it out, but that way. That is actually a, a better way to lead, I've, I've noticed. Uh, I mean, just studying other people. Because when you micromanage, you start getting stressed out. You get all neurotic and stressed and all the rest of it. It's stupid. It's better to just sort of like give a big direction and sort of like go that way. The ship is going that direction and let other people figure it out. Uh, but... Newland isn't like that. She likes to micromanage every fucking little thing. And she did. She micromanaged the Maidan revolution. And that implicated her. That's the important thing. The fact that she so micromanaged the uh, Maidan revolution made it clear that she was the person. Her, fingers, her fingerprints were all over that thing. And it was clear that it was a coup d'etat. It was the violent overthrow of the Yanukovych regime. Whatever you might think of the Yanukovych regime, it was legitimately elected. Nobody disputed the election. But what was key about it was that it showed the split, the ethnic split, the regional split between the center west of the country and the east south of the country, between the, the uh, um, ethnic Ukrainians and the ethnic Russians. And Newland sided with the ethnic Ukrainians against the ethnic Russians. Mm -hmm. And when, Yanuk uh, when uh, Petroshen Poroshenko came to power, the the next president, she made sure that that government abused the Russians. And of course, she made sure that the Ukrainian army started getting seriously supplied with weapons, and she used that Ukrainian army, and she micromanaged this, to attack the Donbass. See, you have to understand that in a very real sense, Victoria Nuland has been president of Ukraine since 2014. She's the person calling the shots. She's the one pulling the strings. She doesn't care about domestic policy in Ukraine. Whatever happens in Ukraine, she could give a rat's ass. She gives free speeches once in a while, and we have to end, you know, corruption in Ukraine. But of course, she doesn't really mean it, because so many of the Washington people benefit from the corruption. See, that's the key issue. So she might claim that she wants to end the corruption, but in fact, she is helping it. She's facilitating the corruption in Ukraine, because 
her political masters back in Washington, the people in politics like Nancy Pelosi, like John Kerry, the, the former Secretary of State under Obama, and her boss when all this shit was going down, uh, um, what's his name, Mick Romney, he, even though he's a Republican, he's a key figure in the money circles. I mean, he's an old McKinsey hand. And all kinds of money flows around Mitt Romney and is directed to people like Kagan and the other foreign policy people at the uh, Council of Foreign Relations. You see, so her job is to make sure that the political support back in Washington keeps her afloat. So the only way that they keep her afloat is that she continues to facilitate the corruption. Because the people I've mentioned, Pelosi, Biden, uh, uh, Kerry, and uh, what's his face, Romney, all of them have sons who are, have no-show jobs in gas companies in Ukraine, clown world that it is. But it's not just that. There are all kinds of shady little deals and shit like that. And like the biolabs, for instance. The biolabs, and we're coming out, and it came out in the Daily Mail a couple of days ago, that these biolabs not only were run by the Department of Defense, they were funded by companies attached to Hunter Biden. Uh, dude, what the fuck? See, I mean, this is... This kind of corruption, they're all like in bed together and all like, and her job is to keep this money train going, see? And at the same time, destroy Russia, see? She uses a corrupt government to destroy Russia. And so the weapons flowed into Ukraine from starting in 2014 after the coup d'etat, after the Maidan revolution, the revolution of dignity, the coup d'etat, well, that's what I call that. Well, she brought in the, um, the weapons, you know, and this, of course, made Raytheon and all these uh, weapons manufacturers so goddamn happy. And she also brought in the military contractors. Mm. The military contractors showed up and trained the Ukrainian armed forces in NATO communications techniques mm, and all kinds of other NATO, uh, uh, NATO appropriate um, maneuvers and tactics and strategies and all the rest of it, see? And uh, why contractors, by the way? Well, because contractors are private individuals. They're just a private company, right? But of course, all of them have deep ties to, to intelligence and to the NATO countries, and especially the American military, okay? So even though they're private contractors, they're for all intents and purposes, Department of Defense officials who are in Ukraine training Ukrainian troops in NATO tactics, okay, for a potential war with Russia to be like this knife in the gut of Russia, waiting, waiting to be stuck, see? And this army, in uh, uh, this Ukrainian army, which in 2014 was trivial size, I do believe it was something like 30,000 men or something like that, I mean, it's like really trivial. Now, just before this war, rather, it was at, uh, I do believe it was 260,000 men and roughly 75,000 frontline fighters. Mm -hmm. That's what I understand. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that happened because of Victoria Newland. see? So she, she's like the nexus of all these different interests that want to exploit Ukraine and use Ukraine to attack Russia with the ultimate goal of breaking up Russia and bringing back the good old days of the 90s, the good old days for the Westerners, the very, very bad old days for the Russians. The Russians don't want a repeat of the 90s. That was traumatic for them, as it would for any country, to be violated that way by Western interests, but... And that violation has continued in Ukraine. That's why Ukrainian is so poor. Understand that, see? But they need to maintain corruption. Like I said, plomo o plata. If you keep everybody corrupt, then they are never going to interfere with your corruption. If I'm paying you money for whatever, and then you see me stealing from someplace else, or one of my buddies stealing, you're not gonna say a fucking thing because you're gonna, you're, you're gonna feel complicit. And that's the whole point of corruption to make everybody feel complicit so that nobody stops any theft. And that's why Ukraine is so poor and broken, because it could be a rich country. It has everything to be Poland, a, a, a very respectable country that was poor in 1991 and has pulled itself out and is rising up like a phoenix. Poland is a wonderful country. I've been there a couple of times, wonderful people. And it is a country that is ascendant. Good on them. Ukraine could be an ascendant country, but the problem is corruption, number one. And number two, this ethnic hatred between Ukrainians towards the Russian half of the country. 
And that's the other problem, of course, it's exactly half, okay? Half the country is Russian. Y Ukraine would be happier, everybody would be happier if Ukraine were split up into a couple of countries, okay? At least a couple of countries, but that, that's for another conversation. Let's focus back now on Victoria Newland. Okay? Now, Victoria Newland, when you listen to her, she's this tidy little woman. Hmm? And like I said, in, in pictures of her when she was younger, she looked very cute. Like, adorable, actually. She looked like an adorable person. But the word is that she is a fucking nightmare. I mean, just a really piece of shit kind of person. And the word I've heard is that she treats her assistants like garbage. You know? And that's always a bad sign. See? See, you always want a person of one line. A person of one line is a person who treats everybody the same. Hmm? I mean, they're deferential and respectful towards older people or important people, but their fundamental attitude is always the same. But the word is that Victoria Newland is very deferential, if not a suck up to people that she considers more powerful than herself and an absolute beast, an arrogant, just horrifying person to anybody that she considers weaker than her or lesser than her or who does not have the ability to, you know, give her an answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a horrible person. Huh? It's a bully. It's the mentality of a bully. And that's Victoria Newland. That's, that's her personality. Huh? She's got this uh, voice, a very melodious voice, if you ask me. When you hear her speaking, uh, she's certainly educated. She's, she's certainly somebody who sounds uh, 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 prepared. Mm -hmm. And her voice is so sweet. And, and, and that is kind of like kind of shocking when you realize what an awful person she is. I mean, I'd love to be there when she lashes out at people. I haven't been able to catch any kind of recording of it. Although that recording with Payet was kind of indicative when she said, fuck the EU. And, and with such disdain and arrogance and resentment. Oof. Oof. She must be something else, man. She'd probably make a very good dominatrix. Yeah. Those of you who are into s and I'm yeah. not. But if you are, you should be dreaming of um, Victoria Newland in a latex suit and a whip. <laughs> and that mellifluous voice of hers. Yeah, because she sounds mellifluous but fucking evil. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, one of the interesting things. Okay, now we're coming up to the Biden administration in our timeline here. Okay. Um, as the Biden administration came together, I mean, basically, the Trump administration was a pause in, in this whole scheme. And the scheme was very simple, to get Ukraine into NATO and cause a provocation that would lead to regime change in Russia. That was the goal. Now, here's what's really interesting. Russia had the great good luck to have Trump win. Now, don't give me this bullshit that, uh, you know, that, that uh, Russian hackers hacked the election. That's how Trump won. That's bullshit. It was basically that, you know, Hillary Clinton didn't win Wisconsin. That's basically the reason, you know, because she didn't pay attention. She thought it was in the bag, okay? She thought it was hers by divine right. Hmm? And by the way, of course, Hillary Clinton and Newland are buddy buddies, you know? I mean, you know, they're, they're very, very close, uh, of course, because somebody like... Um, like Hillary Clinton would know what to do with a woman like Victoria Newland and Victoria Newland with, you know, with her eye on the main chance, as she always has in her entire career, she would know that Hillary Clinton is somebody that she wants to kiss the ring of, right? So anyway, they're buddy buddies and she was supposed to be uh, the president in 2016, but she lost, you know, shockingly. They, they didn't fix the election well enough, basically. It was their own stupid fault. They blamed it on the Russians, but now we know that Russians didn't have any fucking thing to do with it, right? It was just stupid ass incompetence of the DNC, but the point. Those four years, had it not been for those four years, Russia would not be in the position to be able to invade Ukraine. And all of the events that were happening now would have happened four years earlier and Russia would have lost. And potentially, Putin would have been overthrown because had he lost the Donbass, which is what would have happened in, back in 2017, um, you know, his position in Moscow, in the Kremlin, would have been so weakened that he probably would have fallen, okay? That four-year pause allowed multiple things to happen. On the one hand, uh, Putin was able to fortify the economy of Russia to withstand further, more aggressive sanctions, because that's what happened. In 2014, 
uh, as you will recall, and I'm just skip ahead, you know, quickly because I'm assuming that you all know this history. The Russians, in the face of this, um, you know, coup d'état in Ukraine, they went and grabbed Crimea, which of course robbed NATO of the, you know, of of the of the jewel that they really wanted. They wanted Crimea because they wanted Sevastopol, the naval base. And they figured that if they overthrew Yanukovych and put in their own people and Newland micromanaged it, NATO would be able to grab the military base, the naval base at Sevastopol and deprive Russia of a needed naval base. And, and the Black Sea would no longer uh, uh, be Russia's lake. It would be NATO's lake and Russia would become landlocked, which is something that the Russians could not afford. That, that's why they, they went and grabbed it. They went and grabbed Crimea. And the um, Russians also encouraged the separatists in Lugansk and Donetsk. And of course, encouraged them and, and funded them with weapons and all the rest of it to keep that going. Because had it not been for the Russians, that would have ended long ago. And so what happened was that um, that four-year pause of the Trump administration allowed the, oh, and because of this, because of grabbing Crimea and the Donetsk and Lugansk problems, the separatists, all kinds of sanctions were thrown on Putin because that's when the U.S. State Department, the, the foreign policy establishment uh, of all these people that I've mentioned before, Kagan and all the rest of it, that's when they realized that Putin was not their guy. Hmm? Because right up until 2012 or so, they thought, he's, he's our guy, isn't he? Isn't he? Yeah, because they certainly thought that in 99. And they, they thought that through the 2000s. But then slowly they, they're like, is he really our guy? Or is he sort of like, you know, doing things that aren't really to our liking? And, you know, in 2014, he went and grabbed Crimea. And that's what that really pissed him off because they wanted Crimea. It was, it was the big jewel, okay? The, the cherry on the Sunday, and they wanted it badly. And he stole it from them. So they slapped him with sanctions. And of course, Crimea is a peninsula such that it's very easy for the Russians to defend it. The, the idea of invading it, kind of laughable. Okay, but anyway, uh, the Russians grabbed Crimea and for their pains, they were slapped with sanctions that really hurt the Russian economy at that time, much more than the sanctions are hurting them now. Okay, that's something that people don't seem to realize. Yes, there was a big fall in the ruble and yes, there was a big fall in, in the Moscow stock market and all the rest of it, but it bounced back very quickly. Okay, extremely quickly. Uh -huh. And we're pretty much getting to status quo ante insofar as the uh, Russian financial markets are concerned. And their ability to issue debt, no problem, because they're issuing it internally. Mm -hmm. Because they've really battened down the hatches of their economy starting in 2014. See? Yes, of course, the shock of the war, the surprise of it, okay, and the immediate effects insofar as foreign sanctions panicked the market, the market dropped, all the rest of it. But people are suddenly realizing, you know, this, this isn't that bad, especially since China and India. You know, the two largest countries in the world by population and the largest economy in the world, they're backing Russia. There's no daylight. Not between Russia and China, not between Russia and India, not between Russia and, and Iran, mm -hmm. and not between Russia and Venezuela, the other big oil producer, the country that has the largest proven natural, uh, excuse me, the world's largest uh, proven reserves of oil on the planet. No, you know, no daylight between those countries. And the possibility of trading rupees and rubles, all of a sudden people are, investors are realizing, no, the Russians are okay. They are. Mm -hmm. But in 2014, they weren't. And so the Russian economy took a big hit. Putin immediately started on two things because he knew that this shit was going to hit a crescendo at some point. He started um, protecting his economy and creating autarky, that is uh, total independence, which is a very difficult process. But that's the aim that he had, number one. And the other was to have a military that'd be up to snuff, even though he'd been working on that project since at least 2007 with the previous uh, defense minister, whose name slips my mind right now, it's not important. He'd been working at that very diligently of cleaning out the corruption in the uh, military and the military procurement, of course, which is where the corruption usually is. Um, look at the F-35, that's all corruption, man. That's why the plane sucks. And it's, you know, it's going to be a fucking disaster when it's actually deployed in, in a war, in a combat area. That plane is not going to fucking fly. You, know, you heard it here first, boys. Mm. But anyway, uh, the, um, the Russians, they started preparing from 2016 to 2020. Okay? Really preparing, battening down the hatches. 
because they knew what was coming. And what happened is finally Biden administration came in and all these fucking people showed up. It's not just uh, Victoria Newland, people like Jake Sullivan, like Anthony Blinken. Anthony Blinken was instrumental insofar as the, the Iran deal is concerned. He was instrumental in all kinds of fishy shit going on. Okay. Jake Sullivan, he's a specialist in regime change. He was all over the place insofar as Libya is concerned, Iraq, Syria. These people are all about regime change and destroying countries for the benefit of the United States and of American corporate interests and American political corruption. Jake Sullivan and Anthony Blinken were the people who put Hunter Biden in Burisma. Yeah. Those were the two guys. Jake Sullivan, if you don't know, is the National Security, um, the, the, uh, the National Security Council. And Anthony Blinken is the U.S. Secretary of State, the highest foreign policy uh, uh, foreign affairs official in the United States. And so they're the ones who put Hunter Biden in Burisma, as well as all of Hunter Biden's drug dealing and taking friends. Because Hunter Biden has apparently a whole coterie of druggy friends, because he's a druggie, he's a junkie, right? And all these junkies, you know, they're, they're highfalutin, sophisticated, you know, well-dressed, but they're junkies, you know? You ever seen a picture of Hunter Biden without his fake teeth? You know, he's got the teeth of a junkie. He is a fucking junkie, right? But he's the junkie son of the former vice president and now president. And so Jake Sullivan and Anthony Blinken were the ones who put him with, um, in Burisma, and uh, along with all the junkie friends, and that's why... Um, you know, when, when, uh, what's his name, Vladimir Putin was talking about all the drug addicts. Um, I think he was referring to Zelensky and also, uh, the Hunter Biden coterie. Okay. But I mean, and they're all in Ukraine. <laughs> That's the thing, man. Yeah. Mm. You know, you drive around Kiev, right. And there are a bunch of men's clubs and they're huge. They're enormous and extremely expensive. I mean, you, you walk in and you got to drop a couple of grand at least. Okay. Dollars. They're extremely expensive. Why the fuck you think that they exist? And like downtown Kiev, mm -hmm. beautiful hookers. I mean, it's, uh, incredible, right? And, uh, and, and very expensive and very tasteful, but a nightclub, and so it's fundamentally gaudy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's in the DNA of the place, right? Uh, but why do you think that there's so many of them? Because these Westerners, these sons of politicians and all the rest of it, they go to Ukraine to play. Cocaine, hookers, all kinds of stuff. And of course, there's all kinds of videotape. That's the thing. Uh, that's the key issue. See? See, all these guys are, are compromised. Compromat, as the Russians call it. And, and, you know, the Chinese have this compromat. You know, the Russians have it. The Ukrainians have it. There's all kinds of shit on these people. Okay? And, you know, that's the terror, the panic of the people in Washington. Mm -hmm. Because most of them, I mean, like, how could I put it? See, if you're a fairly squeaky clean guy, I mean, l l take my case. Yeah, you know, I like to fuck around as much as the next guy, right? I've never done anything like really egregious. If anything came out like publicly, it'd be like, yeah, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, you, you lead a fairly straight and narrow kind of life. But these guys don't, you know, all kinds of decadences and degeneracies, you know? And if some of the pictures that were on the Hunter Biden laptop are true, you know, we're talking about uh, um, beyond merely, you know, corruption. We're talking, you know, uh, uh, um, how can I put it in a way that YouTube won't get me banned or stripped or whatever, deplatformed. Uh, we're talking about um, trafficking in SEX, in C-H-I-L-D, okay? I mean, just really disgusting stuff. And there are pictures. Okay, they kind of like prove that shit and that implicate other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all kinds of ugly. Okay. And so the point is that, see, all of these people are all wrapped up in this ball of corruption around Ukraine because Ukraine is this trough where they can feed, feed on money and drugs and women and ecstasy, not the pill, but the feeling, the vibe of ecstasy of just lawlessness. What Russia used to be back in the 90s, mm -hmm. which they want to reimpose on Russia. And of course, which Putin doesn't want. You know? 
for selfish reasons of his own, the bastard. <laughs> so anyway, that's what's going on. And so, um, yeah, so we're up to October 2021. So what's going on, as soon as the Biden administration comes to office in January of 2020, uh, 2021, right, they start implementing a plan. Victoria Newland starts implementing a plan. And the plan is very simple. They're going to invade the Donbass and they're going to take it back from the separatists, right? Now, I'm not going to go into the whole history of it because you all know it. If you don't know it, go and see plenty of videos I've made of. So they're going to go back in and take back the separatist republics of Lugansk and Donetsk, right? And here's something I've noticed about women. Hmm? See, if you're with a girlfriend or a wife and she starts saying to you, are you cheating on me? You know, and she starts like checking your clothes and, and stuff to see if you're cheating on her. She's fucking around on you. It's a tick. Women have this. And, uh, and it's true. And every guy can tell you the exact same thing. When a woman accuses you of anything, it's because she's doing it to you right now. Mm -hmm. She says, you don't listen to me enough. It's because she doesn't pay attention to you at all. You know, you don't love me enough. Mm -hmm. Are you cheating on me? I'm telling you, it's, 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 it's the way of women, man. And, and you know, feminists and, and, you know, whatever, whomever loser is watching this and having like a little hissy fit. I'm sorry, but it's the truth, okay? Victoria Newland started saying that the Russians were surround, were, were putting troops on the border with Ukraine, blah, 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 and getting like a whole hissy fit about it. And what was really going on was that she was encouraging Zelensky that she had handpicked, mm -hmm by way of our association with Igor Kolomoisky, they were the ones who decided that Zelensky would be the president. This perfect vehicle, an actor who would do exactly what they wanted. That's what happened. That's how Zelensky got picked. It wasn't just Igor Kolomoisky, which is what I thought earlier. I started looking into this shit and Victoria Nuland is all over this shit. She's right there with Kolomoisky. They practically had a casting session to decide who was gonna be the next president of Ukraine. And they made up their minds and they micromanaged it so that uh, Zelensky became president, you know? But he's a puppet and he's controlled by Victoria Nuland and by Ihor Kolomoisky, or he used to be. Now he no longer is controlled by Ihor Kolomoisky and I'll tell you who controls him now in just a second, okay? So anyway, um, in in January, the, the, the word is that now that the Biden administration is in power, they're going to set up the conditions for Ukraine to go into the Donbass, take back Lugansk and Donetsk, and, you know, a big fuck you very much to the Russians. In February of 2021, they even went so far, the Ukrainians even went so far as to declare that they were going to take back Crimea by any means necessary, leaving the door open to the use of force to take back Crimea. Hmm? And who do you think encouraged that? Victoria Nuland, of course, see? So Victoria Nuland is pushing the Zelensky regime to confront the Russians and egging them on, and they decide to assemble an army, okay? There, there's the crisis in April, in the, in the spring of uh, 2021, but things really start going in, tw in October of 2021, where Nuland goes to the Kremlin, and in the Kremlin, and word is that this was in Russian. She spoke to them in Russian. And the word is that she used the most, you know, sailor-like language imaginable. I mean, really, really vulgar shit. He basically told the Russians to their faces, told Lavrov to his face, that she would crush his economy unless, she do, unless they did exactly what she wanted, which was no more support for the Donbass to pull out of the Donbass so that the Ukrainian army could sweep in and take it. And she threatened them. To their face. I mean, you got to say that she had balls, okay? I mean, not many people go into the Kremlin and just threaten them right to their face, man. <laughs> you got to admire that, you know? I mean, I, I, you know, see, you can uh, remember, well, you probably don't remember, but in 79, uh, yeah, 79, at the end of 1979, Time Magazine said that the Ayatollah Khomeini was the man of the year. And everybody had a hissy fit. And I'm like, why? I remember I was like 11 years old, not quite 12 years old. And I was thinking, why is everybody getting upset? He was the most influential man of, of the year, whether you like him or not, whether you think he's a moral man or an evil man, but he was the man most influential. By the same token, you know, I look at Newland going to the Kremlin and threatening them like that to their fucking face. Balls. I respect that. 
you know, I don't like her. I think she's fucking evil, but I can respect that. It was a power move, man. And it must have rattled the Russians because they kept talking about it for months afterward, right? But also it put them on notice. Mm -hmm. And so um, all the time the Americans were talking about Russians putting troops on the border with Ukraine. But what was really going on was that Ukraine was putting its frontline fighters on the contact line with the Donbass. And they were preparing for a lightning strike. It was going to be an invasion, two days, four days tops, just sweep through and take over the whole fucking thing and level the whole fucking place because they were going to do NATO tactics. NATO tactics are American tactics. And the American mode of war is to destroy everything, kill them all, let God sort them out. Mm -hmm. Kill all the civilians, every man, woman, and child. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Kill them all. Turn the whole place to fucking rubble and declare it victory. Mm -hmm. That's what they were going to do, right? And what happened was that, and they were going to do that in March. The word is that the order was going to go on, uh, the, the, the invasion was going to happen in mid-March. And the Russians simply beat them to it. Because one of the things that freaked out NATO back in the spring of 2021 was that there were some problems and, and the Russians moved about 150,000 soldiers in 72 hours. It freaked the fuck out of, the, uh, out of NATO because that's a lot of fucking men to move in that short time, okay? And yeah, there's been a lot of issues like logistics now in this invasion, be that as it may, but moving the troops around like that, the Russians did it and they accomplished it. And so the word is that um, basically Putin realized that the... the the um, Ukrainian army was going to sweep into the Donbass and he was going to let that happen. Because what happened was, of course, and what we're seeing with some of the atrocities of the Ukrainian armed forces. You see, after the 2014 uh, coup d'etat, right, all these uh, extremist groups, yeah, you know, the uh, right sector and all those people, they were disbanded nominally. And they were integrated into the Ukrainian armed forces, okay? But they were spread out throughout. And so they acted as stiffeners insofar as extremism within the Ukrainian armed forces. Because there's a concept of stiffening, which is in, in military, uh, sometimes what's good is that you have, like, for instance, you have a fuck-up unit or a platoon, a platoon that's not very good. And so you bring in, like, a really, really good soldier, and he acts as a stiffener, a stiffening agent to make the whole unit stronger. And he comes in and sort of like imposes dif discipline. He's not a sergeant. He's not a non-commissioned officer. He's simply a soldier that has been given direction to bring up the standards of the whole unit. And that helps a lot. And that's why, for instance, professional um, mercenaries are often used and have historically been used as stiffeners for large armies of less disciplined soldiers because they, they are brought in and spread out around and they bring up the morale and the discipline of all the units, you see? Instead of having to train each individual unit, you just spread out these people. But the same thing happened essentially ideologically with these extremist uh, groups, right sector, um, S-14 and all the rest of it. They were spread out throughout the Ukrainian armed forces. And so all of the Ukrainian armed forces have this uh, um, extremist bias, this, this hyper-nationalist, pro-Ukrainian, anti-Russian attitude that devolves into um, atrocities and human rights violations, which we started to see. I mean, I posted those videos today, as a matter of fact, okay? And so what happens is that um, after 2015, these men were spread out throughout the entire Ukrainian armed forces and the U Ukrainian armed forces were in indeed grown and better equipped and supplied and they became a an extremist army. And they were planning on sweeping into the Donbass and just annihilating everything. And that's when Putin pulled the, pulled the trigger and said, we're going to beat them to the punch. And that's where we're in the situation we're in. Now, uh, Victoria Newland was instrumental in pushing for this invasion of the Donbass. And she now has Dimitro Yarosh. Remember that guy from 2014, the head of the right sector? Well, he is the guy who is advising Zelensky about how to conduct the war. And Yarosh controls the current army chief, whose name I neglected to write down in, the, in my notes, but it's not important. Yarosh is an extremist, a hardcore extremist, you know. As to whether he's an anti-Semite or not, I don't know. But there he is working with a Jewish woman out in Washington, a small, petite, tidy little Jewish woman, 
uh, in Washington named Victoria Newland, and he takes his orders from her. And he passes along to her all of the information from the negotiations. I mean, she's micromanaging this whole fucking thing, okay? Now, she, Newland, admitted recently uh, in congressional testimony uh, about the biolabs. And she said that, you know, the biolabs, indeed, it was American <laughs> biological laboratories in Ukraine, 26 of them, or 30 of them. And uh, I should pin down that number. I always keep forgetting to pin that n number down, but it doesn't matter. It's roughly the same number. And, and those biolabs, um, she's very concerned that the Russians will capture them because the Russians might use that against them and commit some atrocity. You know, so basically, she's admitting that they're bioweapons, all kinds of nasty shit. Okay, and she admitted it. I don't know if it was on purpose or a slip of the tongue. And I suspect it might have been a slip of the tongue because she looked shocked and surprised. You know, I just sort of like it was a question that Marco Rubio tossed at her. It was supposed to be a softball, but it caught her flat footed. And I think that she panicked and it happens to the best of us. Okay. And, you know, especially when you're juggling a lot of lies like Victoria Newland is. And she let loose that the biolabs were like real American. Yeah. And more information is coming out that whole shit show, right? But basically, she is the one insisting that there is going to be a chemical attack. First, it was biological attack, but now it's chemical attack. Mm -hmm. And she's pushing that story. And she's the one who's micromanaging, apparently, the, the whole, um, the whole uh, uh, PR campaign mm -hmm. that is convincing everybody in the West that the Russians are losing, the Ukrainians are winning, which will give the justification for the false flag. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that Anthony Blinken and, um, Anthony Blinken, I mean, because we don't have to worry about uh, Wendy Sherman, Anthony Blinken, also, of course, Jake Sullivan, they are taking, you know, uh, uh, supporting roles. Victoria Newland is the one running this show because she's, first of all, she's the only one who knows Russian. She knows the history intimately. And because of her own, uh, 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 you know, psychodrama, you know, she's the perfect person to be reading, leading this whole shit show. This is hers. She's the person in charge, you know? Uh, you know, they, in, in war games, they talk about Team Red and Team Blue. Well, if Team Red, is the leader is Putin. Team Blue, it's Victoria Newland, And she's running this whole shit show, okay? Even though she's just an undersecretary of state for political affairs, which seems very obscure and trivial, she's the woman. She's the woman driving this war. She's the woman who's creating the conditions for a false flag attack. Mm -hmm. And it's coming. No question about it. It's coming and it's going to be something awful. And there are going to be a lot of dead people. It's no different from the snipers that I am convinced that she organized. Okay. Now, there's no proof of this. There's no proof. Okay. But circumstantially, and you know, we're all grown-ups. We can make the obvious inference. Who would benefit from this shit? Victoria Newland. Mm -hmm. She had the goal of overthrowing the um, Yanukovych regime. And so she used these snipers. Uh -huh. And were they Israeli snipers? It seems logical. If they, were not, if they weren't Israeli snipers, then they were some private military contractor snipers. American, you know, from wherever. Uh, uh, Black, um, Blackwater or whatever the name of the successor is, you know. Um, yeah. And so she's used to that. She's used to that kind of game. Okay. Now, you got to keep in mind, Dimitro Yarosh, this crazy guy from right sector. He's the guy who's actually in control in Ukraine. It's not Zelensky. Okay. He's the guy and he takes his marching orders. He's got a little earpiece and he gets the word from Victoria Newland. Okay. And she's micromanaging this whole fucking thing. Okay. And the destiny of tens of millions of people depend on her and whether the United States goes to nuclear war depends on her. And it, this, this woman, because of these ancient ancestral hatreds mm -hmm. that she carries in her heart, that burned in her, in her soul as a girl of eight, nine, ten years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. It's fucking frightening if you ask me, but yeah. Anyway, I've talked long enough and I don't really have anything else to say. I don't know how think this is going to end. Uh, I hope it ends peacefully. I hope that Victoria Newland's desire for a horrifying attack that will kill 
tens or hundreds or thousands of civilians that will justify a NATO invasion. I hope that that does not come to pass, but I am extremely pessimistic because one of the things about Victoria Newland that you realize is that she is extremely effective. And remember, she's not alone. She's got her husband, uh, Robert Kagan, and that whole cabal of people, all of them carrying this ancient ancestral resentment towards Russia. They hate Russia so much. They want it destroyed. Huh? And I insist it's not because of money. It's because of, you know, this a psychodrama that is over a century old at this point. Uh, you have to understand that. Uh, you have to understand how uh, um, the persecution of Jews in Russia 115 years ago, 120 years ago, is the cause of this war. You have to understand that, okay? And they will not rest. They will not rest until Russia is destroyed. Mm -hmm. The only thing that will keep them at bay is a collapsing America, where they have to figure out what the hell is going on, okay? And the Amer uh, collapsing America is happening awfully quickly, okay? So it might actually be, you know, a race to see which happens first. Uh -huh. But, you know, it, it's an ugly, ugly situation. And what's most important of all is that these people feel that they are so close to destroying Russia. So close. And that's why they, they you know, it's not only that the masks are off, any kind of limitation is off. Everything is on the table. And the Biden slips that have been happening where Biden has said to the 82nd Airborne that you're going to see when you get to Ukraine, like they're going to invade Ukraine. And, uh, you know, Putin, we got to get rid of him. He's a bad man. You know, regime change. You know, it's on the table, man. This is total war. Mm -hmm. The Americans have not fired weapons yet at the Russians, but they fired virtual weapons, every single one. And right now, you know, do you have any idea what kind of virtual cyber warfare that must be going on, man. It must be all over the fucking place, okay? I'm telling you, this war is going on. Victoria Nuland is the commanding general of Team Blue, and she's relentless, okay? But the thing is, see, Putin, he's a crafty motherfucker. That's a, that's a fact, okay? I mean, the fucker has not survived 23 years as president of Ukraine, as the undisputed leader of, of Ukraine, the undisputed leader of Russia for 23 years, unless he's crafty as a fox, okay? So we're going to see how these two competitors uh, match up, okay? But it's going to be close. It's going to be goddamn close. Hmm? So anyway, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time.